Today's video is going to be all about the Kim One single board computer, originally made by MOS Technology in 1976. Then, of course, we all know Commodore bought MOS in 1976. They kept selling them. Now, you can see the input device here is this tiny little keypad. It just gave you numeric and hex, right? You can imagine that if you spent like an hour or two typing in a whole program on this and it worked and everything was great, you want to be able to save the thing somehow, right? Well, that's what today is going to be all about. How you save and load programs to and from a cassette player, cassette recorder. But I'm going to teach you the basics about it, the really simple. I've never, ever, ever used the Kim One before. How do I save stuff? You'll get that. Then we're going to take a deeper look at this. We want to dive in and figure out how that works. How does it actually save stuff on tape? What What's the data format? Once we get past that, we're going to look at the kernel source code and really dig into how it works. And then if you stick around to the very end, you're going to love it. We're going to use a Commodore PET computer to emulate a cassette drive and play a program into this from a pet. So sit back, relax, let's have some fun. I need a simple program I can enter to the Kim One so I can demonstrate saving a program to tape and loading it back. For that, I'll turn to the first book of Kim by Jim Butterfield. Age nine, here we go, mini program A. Now, before I start entering code, I'll heat the warning up near the top of the page to set up the NMI and IRQ vectors. These two locations are 16-bit addresses stored low byte first to tell the Kim One where to jump when an NMI or IRQ occur. They'll both be set to hex 1C00. The example program ends with a BRK or break instruction, and for that to work, the IRQ vector needs to be set. Now I can start entering the example program. The starting address is hex 0200. I only have to enter the start address. Once I begin data entry, the Kim One will auto increment the address for me each time I enter a data byte and press the plus key. The 00 at hex 0208 is the break instruction that ends the sample program. I'm going to cycle through real quick here, starting at hex 0200, just to check my work. Looks good. The sample program does nothing more than swap the bytes at memory locations hex 10 and hex 11. Let's take a look at those locations before we run the program. All right, DC is stored at 1-0 and C9 at 1-1. One, one. Remember that for after we run this. To run the program, we go to the start address 0200 and then press the go button on the keypad. Now I'll look at memory locations 1-0 and 1-1 one, one again and confirm their contents have been swapped. And they have. Here's where we get to the meat of this video. Now that I've laboriously entered a machine language program one byte at a time by painstakingly typing on the Kim One's tiny keypad, I want to have some way of saving it so I don't have to type it in again. The Kim One can be natively connected to a tape recorder to accomplish this. To be able to use a tape device, you had to wire it up yourself to the 44-pin female edge connector that MOS provided with the Kim One. The user manual included instructions on how to connect it. Similarly, MOS did not provide a power supply with the Kim One either. That also had to be provided by the purchaser and wired up to the edge connector. I bring this up because I'm cheating a little bit in this regard. I'm using a Corsham I.O. board that provides all of this and more for me. As you can see, all I had to do was plug in a mono audio cable to the audio in and audio out jacks on the Corsham board and then run them over to my cassette player. Don't pay attention to my professional hot glue job there where I soldered my power supply directly to the Corsham I.O. board. With my example program sitting in memory on the Kim One and a cassette recorder connected and ready to go, now I'll turn to the Kim One user manual to find out how to save my program to cassette. There is no load or save command on the Kim One like you would have used on a Commodore 64. Instead, you just have to know the memory address of the kernel load and save routines. I'll walk you through all the details. For starters, clear decimal mode. Thank you. 
Next, you have to tell the save routine the start and end addresses of your program. They're stored in low bite, high bite format, as is typical. Think of the ID as your file name. It's any number you choose between 1 and FE. The good part's coming up. Now we get to put a cassette tape in. Here's where we get ready to execute the kernel save routine. It's located at hex 1800. Now I press record. My program's now saved to tape. I'm going to go back to 0200 and wipe out my program so I can show you loading it back from tape. F1 is already 0, so I'll start by entering the ID I want to load, 01. Same deal as with save. You have to know the address of the load kernel routine. It's hex 1873. Now you press play on tape and you wait. When it's done loading, you'll see a 0000 for success, FFFF for failure, or it'll just seek forever if it doesn't find data. Done. Let's look for our program now. As expected, our program loaded back perfectly. So now I'm wondering how this works. What did the Kim One write out to tape anyway? Let's give that a quick listen. Ah, uh, that sound evokes great childhood memories for me. Anyway, let's open the user manual and learn more about what that sound is. Ah, uh, look at that. Appendix E, audio tape format. Computer manuals used to be so much better in 1976 than they are today. So what does the user manual tell us about how data is stored? The first two paragraphs here tell us that there are some error detection methods in place and that all the data is ASCII encoded. Further to that, we see that the problem of storing 8-bit data values as 7-bit ASCII was solved by splitting each byte into two 4-bit nibbles, then each nibble is converted to ASCII and stored to tape. So each byte of our program is going to consume two bytes of storage. Moving on to the next paragraph, this describes what each record looks like. A record here means the entire blob of data we're writing to tape. The Kim1 kernel save routine writes out one record. So, let's see what a record looks like. Each record begins with a leader of 100 SIN characters, which are ASCII 16. Then there's an asterisk, which is ASCII 2A. After that comes the single byte ID you choose when you save a program. Then the 16-bit start address of your program in low high order. That is followed up by the actual data bytes that you're saving. An ASCII 2F character marks the end of the data portion of the record. Then there's a 2-byte checksum. And finally, two EOT characters, ASCII 04. We're starting to scratch the surface now, right? We know exactly what the Kim1 writes out to tape. We don't yet know how that data is represented on tape, so I'm going to keep reading and see what I can find out. Ah, uh, this page is great. This explains the sounds we heard when I played back what was recorded on tape by the Kim1. Our ears process sound waves by amplitude, which is the height of the wave. That determines the volume. And by frequency, which is the time between cycles. That determines the pitch. We typically measure sound frequencies in cycles per second or hertz. If I dust off some high school algebra, I can calculate cycles per second. If there are nine pulses in 2.484 milliseconds, 
How many pulses are there in a thousand milliseconds, which is one second? Cross multiply to solve for x, and we arrive at 3,623 hertz. Similarly, the six pulse waves cycle at 2,415 hertz. Those are the frequencies our ears hear when playing back Kim 1 data from tape. So, now we know that Kim 1 represents each data bit on tape as three 2.484 millisecond groups of pulses for a total of 7.452 milliseconds per bit. It's nine pulses, nine pulses, six pulses for a logical zero, and nine pulses, six pulses, six pulses for a logical one. Reading that is great, but I'd like to actually see it in action. So I'm going to connect the logic analyzer to pin P on the Kim One's application connector, which is the high audio data output line. This is what I captured in the logic analyzer. It's the result of saving the example program I typed in. Both of these signals are the same. It's pin P from the Kim 1 application connector. On the top, it's shown as a digital signal. On the bottom, it's its true analog form. I just find it easier on my eyes to count the digital representation because it's more uniform. I'll zoom in to get us started. We can use this analyzer output to confirm what we already learned in the Kim 1 user manual. You can easily spot the difference between the 9 pulse higher frequency and the 6 pulse lower frequency at a glance. The 9 pulse frequency is about what we expect, 3.5 kilohertz. Likewise with the 6 pulse frequency around 2.4 kilohertz. Now let's count the pulses and confirm that the first byte is a 16 like we expect. One note, the first pulse up there is spurious, I'm not going to count that one. Bear with me while I try to adjust to get as close as I can to fitting exactly one bit worth of pulses per screen. Looks good, now let's count pulses. That was the first eight bits, and it was exactly what was documented, ASCII 16. There should be 99 more of them too, but wait just a second here. What happened to every byte being split into two four-bit nibbles and then converted to ASCII? We should have seen a one and a six as the first two bytes, no? The wording here is specific, data retrieved from memory. The kernel code is only splitting up your program bytes into nibbles. All the record metadata is stored as plain old seven-bit ASCII. We have learned an awful lot about how to write data from a Kim 1 to tape. Awesome. I think we've gotten about as far as we can get without starting to dig into the kernel source code. That's what we're going to do next. We want to find out how, like, for example, how does it create those pulses it creates? We saw that it does. We even saw it in a logic analyzer. It works. It's awesome. It's perfect. How's that work? Uh, how's it write the checksum out? We know there's a checksum in there. How's that work? So let's go check that stuff out next. Ah, the good old days. Back when the user manual for your computer came with that kernel source code printed in the appendix. This is the source of the ROM code that lives in the 6530-003 chip. Recall from earlier when we wanted to save our program, we had to go to address 1800 and then press go. The kernel save to tape routine lives at 1800. Well, here's the source code starting at hex 1800. The entire structure of the routine is visible on this page, so I'll walk through it at a high level first. Remember that the record structure began with 100 ASCII SIN bytes? That happens from hex 1812 through hex 181A. The X register gets loaded with hex 64, which is decimal 100, then the code JSRs to the alt CHT label. That's a routine that outputs a character to tape. When it returns from that, it decrements the X register and loops back up to output another until the X register decrements to zero. When that loop completes, the code will have written 100 SIN bytes to tape. Recall how the 16 we looked at in the logic analyzer wasn't broken up into separate nibbles? Out CHT does not do that. It just writes out eight bits. 181C and 181E write out the asterisk. 
1821 and 1824 right off the tape ID. This uses OutBT, which is output byte to tape. OutBT does break the 8-bit number up into two 4-bit nibbles before writing out the tape, but it has to here because the ID can be any number up to FE, and that wouldn't fit into 7 bits. 1827 through 1830 writes out the starting address, low byte, then high byte. The OutBTC routine is output byte to tape checksum. It's identical to OutBT, except it will count toward the checksum that gets written out near the end of the record. 183 through 183F or what writes the actual data bytes out. The dump T4 label isn't on this page, but you're not missing much. This just loops through every byte in memory from the starting byte to the end byte you specify and writes it out to tape, adding to the checksum with each byte. The rest is more of the same, so I won't go through it line by line. Write out the 2F, the checksum, the EOT cares. That's the entire main structure of the kernel tape save routine. I'll flip forward a few pages here so we can dig into some of the routines that are used as part of the kernel save to tape routine. Let's walk through the CHKT routine seen here. Part of the record that Kim1 saves to tape is a 16-bit checksum value. It computes the same checksum when it loads a record back from tape so it can tell if there were any read errors. Let's look at how it works. I put the 6502 registers and flags up on the screen along with relevant Kim1 memory addresses so you can follow along. Note that unaffected registers and flags aren't shown to keep things simple. The first instruction transfers A to Y. This is done for no reason other than to preserve the value of the accumulator so it can be put back before returning to the caller. CLC clears the carry flag. ADC adds the contents of the accumulator, the carry, and the value stored at CHKL. The result is 4C, so the accumulator is unchanged. STA stores the accumulator at CHKL. CHKH is loaded into the accumulator. ADC adds the value zero to the accumulator, which is zero, and carry, which is zero. The result is zero. The accumulator is stored in CHKH. Now TYA will restore the original value back to the accumulator. RTS returns back to the caller. Let's pretend we get called again. This time the accumulator has a 2-3 in it. Same deal. Preserve the accumulator. Clear the carry that wasn't set anyway. 4C plus 2-3 is 6F. The carry is not set here. 6F is stored at CHKL. Nothing worthwhile mentioning, so I'll let the rest of it run through. I'll do one more run through so you can see how the high byte in the checksum gets set. This time we'll start with D1 in the accumulator. When we add D1 plus 6F, the result is 140, which doesn't fit in a single byte. We end up with 40 stored in the accumulator and the carry flag set. Now when this ADC happens, the accumulator is zero, we add the value zero, and the carry is set, resulting in a one which is then stored in CHKH, resulting in the correct 16-bit value of 140. That should be enough to illustrate how the checksum works. At the conclusion of the save routine, the checksum will be the sum total of every saved byte. Moving on to OutBTC now, it will become obvious how OutBT and OutBTC are the identical routine, with the only difference being that OutBTC does a checksum. If you JSR to OutBTC, the first thing it does is the checksum call before it falls through to OutBT. TAY to preserve the accumulator. Now the code does a logical shift write four times, which shifts off the low four bits. This is where the code splits each byte into nibbles that are ASCII encoded individually. Here the code calls hex out, which we haven't looked at yet, but it does the ASCII encoding and writes out the 8-bit value to tape. We can't know if the value in the accumulator has changed, so I'll clear it out. But it doesn't matter for our purposes because it gets restored from the Y register next anyway. Then hex out is called again to deal with the low 4 bits. We must assume hex out will deal with the fact that the high 4 bits are being included here. With both nibbles having been dealt with, we TYA to restore the accumulator and then return. I'm going to walk through hex out next. Two quick things. One, the last line is actually on the next page in the real book, but you see it here through the magic of photo editing software. Two, there's no RTS here. Hex out falls through to out CHT. I want to dig into out CHT separately, so we'll just focus on the ASCII encoding bits here in hex out. The comment tells us this converts the least significant digits of whatever is in the accumulator to ASCII. I threw a table up on the screen to show you what's involved in doing so. The routine only has to convert 4-bit numbers, so that's 0 through F in hex. This would almost be as easy as just adding hex 30, except for those punctuation characters from 3A to 40. So what the code does is to check if the value to convert is greater than 9 and add an extra 7 if it needs to. I'll walk you through a couple examples so you can see what I mean. We left off with OutBT passing 4C into hex alt, and I mentioned that this routine must somehow handle the high nibble bits being set. Let's find out. 
And yeah, first thing the code does is mask off the four high bits, leaving us with 0C. Then it compares against 0A, clears the carry bit, and does a BMI to test the negative flag. N is not set, so it does not branch. It adds 7, then 3, 0. Back to our ASCII table, you can see the result. Hex 43 is ASCII letter C. I'll run through one more example so you can see how it handles values less than A. And 0F does nothing because the high four bits are already 0. CMP sets the end flag because 4 is less than A. CLC does nothing because the carry flag isn't set. This time, BMI follows the branch because the end flag is set. This makes it skip adding 7 and only adds 3, 0. The result is 3, 4, which is ASCII 4. As I said, hex out falls through to out CHT to actually write the data to tape. So now I'll walk through out CHT. The first two instructions store the contents of the X and Y registers so they can be put back how they were found when this routine is done. 8 is loaded into the Y register. That will count down the number of bits that are to be processed. Next, it does a JSR 1. The 1 and 0, 0 routines that are called from here are not aptly named. 1 outputs 9 pulses and 0 outputs 6 pulses. So this JSR will output 9 pulses to tape. It does this before it knows the value of the bit it's writing up because every bit begins with 9 pulses regardless. Logical shift write will shift the lowest bit off the accumulator. I'll run through the logic twice in this routine so you can see both examples. For this time, I'll pretend that bit is a 0. Branch on carry set won't branch here because we shifted off a 0, so the code JSR is to 1 to output 9 pulses. Then it jumps to label CHT3 where it will output the final six pulses to complete writing out a zero bit. After that, it decrements Y and loops to process another bit until Y counts down to zero. Pretend we did a rewind here. Now we're gonna look at what the code does when it processes a one bit. This time, branch on carry set will branch since we shifted a one off the accumulator. It branches down to CHT2 where it writes out six pulses. Then in the next instruction, writes out the final six pulses to complete writing out a one bit. The Y register is decremented, and it will loop until all 8 bits of this byte have been written to tape. Let's take a look at the 1 routine now. This is the code that generates 9 pulses, so I need to understand exactly how that happens. The code begins by loading a 9 into the X register. This 9 is the pulse count. Then it pushes the accumulator onto the stack for preservation. Then it bits CLKRDI. Well, I can't tell what this code does if I don't know what CLKRDI is. I can tell from the code that it's at address 1747. And skipping ahead, I can see the code also uses 1744 and 1742. A quick glance at a Kim1 memory map from the user manual reveals that 6530-002 IO and timer are mapped in from 1740 to 17FF. I'll turn back a few pages here to the beginning of the code because there are some comments that explain what these locations are. One seven four two is the sixty five thirty dash zero zero two peripheral B data register. One seven four three is the peripheral B data direction register. This controls whether peripheral B pin is an input or an output. One seven four four is the divide by one timer. The sixty five thirty interval timer can be used to count at different time intervals using a divide register, depending on which address you write to and read from. CLK1T uses a divisor of 1T, where T is the system clock period of 1 MHz. 8T would be the system clock divided by 8, 64T would be the system clock divided by 64, and so on. The code in 1 and 0 use the 1T timer. I also need to mention that in addition to being able to select the clock interval divisor depending on the address you use, you can also choose whether to enable or disable interrupts. Writing to 1744 selects the 1T interval timer with interrupts disabled, while 174C would select the 1T interval timer with interrupts enabled. This is where 1747 comes in. 1747 is the read timer status register. If you choose to not have an interrupt fire when the interval timer reaches zero, you can pull bit seven of the read timer status register at 1747. When the interval timer reaches zero, bit 7 of 1747 will be set. I'm done here, so I'll flip to the next page because there's a bit of setup that happens there. 
PBF gets loaded into the accumulator. The comment says convert PB7 to output. Indeed, if you look at the binary representation of BF, bit 7 is a 1. Every bit other than bit 6 is a 1. In the next instruction, that's written out to the peripheral B data direction register. So in fact, it's setting pin 0 through 5 and pin 7 as outputs. The only pin it's not setting is pin 6. Looking at the schematic for the KIM-1 will help us to understand what's going on. I circled the 6530 here. PB0 through PB5 and PB7 are all outputs. PB6 is not. The 6530s were highly configurable chips, and on the 6530-002, MOS made pin 18 a chip select pin instead of a peripheral pin. With that out of the way, let's get back to PB7, which is what was mentioned in the comment there. The schematic reveals why PB7 needs to be set up as an output in the tape save routine. The PB7 pin connects to the KIM-1 audio circuit shown here, which you can see eventually goes out through the audio low and audio high outputs on the application connector. With those questions answered, let's get back to where we left off in the code. We left off at this bit instruction. Bit does a logical AND of the memory location specified and the value in the accumulator. In this case, the code doesn't care what's in the accumulator. It's relying on the manner in which bit affects processor status flags. Bit sets the N or negative flag to whatever is in bit 7 of the value in memory that's being tested. We know that the 6530 is going to set bit 7 of 1747, clock RDI, to a 1 whenever the interval timer reaches 0. BPL is the branch on plus instruction. It branches when the negative flag is not set which it's not, so it's going to branch right back up to the previous instruction. Notice that the interval timer, clock 1T at 1744, continues to count down. By the time we branch back up to the bit instruction, the interval timer has expired. The 6530 set bit 7 in 1747, and the bit instruction caused the N flag to be set when it evaluated the value in 1747. Also note, my examples over here, they're not going to be cycle exact. I'll try to make it not a complete work of fiction, but my human brain isn't up to making it perfect. Now when we get to this BPL instruction, it will not branch because the end flag is set. Next, we do an LDA of 126. That is stored in CLK1T. This sets the interval timer and causes it to immediately start counting down to zero. Now A7 is loaded into the accumulator and then stored in SBD. You can see the comment here says that will set PB7 to 1. I used binary to represent A7 in SBD, so you can more easily see that bit 7 is set. And just in case it wasn't obvious, setting PB7 high for 126 clock ticks is what will generate the crest of the very first pulse that is being written to tape. Now the code does the exact same loop as above, waiting for the interval timer to expire. I'll show a few iterations here and then fake it going to zero. The interval timer expired, same as before. Clock RDI gets bit 7 set by the 6530, the end flag is set by the bit instruction. BPL does not branch. Then it reloads CLK1T with 126. After that, it turns off PB7. Then it decrements X, which is the pulse counter, and goes back to the top of the routine. We already walked through this loop where it waits for the interval timer to expire. This 126 clock ticks is what will generate the valley of the very first pulse that is written to tape. Finally, the fun part using a Commodore PET computer to play a program to a KIM-1 over the audio interface. How does this work? Well, anyone who has ever played Space Invaders on the PET has seen the opening screen that shows you how to get sound out of your PET by hooking the CB2 pin up to an amp and speaker. Clever programmers figured out how to generate sound from the 6522's shift register, but you saw how the KIM-1 code generates the necessary tones using the interval timer on the 6530. The 6522 also has an interval timer, I reasoned that with extremely minimal changes, I'd be able to run code on the PET that runs the KIM-1 save routine and pipe that output into the actual KIM-1 running the load routine. I'm cheating slightly here because I didn't bother to build my own CB2 sound output for the PET. Instead, I'm using the stupid PET tricks created by Jim Happel. Jim is the same fellow who created the virtual reality VR64 goggles. Truly a great fella. Anyway, Jim's stupid pet tricks made my life a little easier. All I had to do was run an audio wire. 
I'll do a quick walkthrough of the code so you can see how minimal the changes are. On the left is the 6530-003 source code. On the right is my modified version of the same that runs on a pet and uses the 6522 instead of the 6530 to generate the sound pulses. All this stuff here is unrelated to the tape load routine, so you can see it doesn't exist in my code. Starting with CHKL, several of these are used, but the Kim1 code used RAM from the 6530, so my code has to use different memory locations to store this stuff. The next difference that's obvious in my code on the right, all the PET 6522 VIA register definitions. Likewise, at my start label, I had to do some 6522 initialization work, but once we get down here to where dump T starts, have a look, they're identical. Now, in the 6530 code here, it gets into the load code, which obviously isn't in my code. I only copied over the save routine, so that can all be skipped. Here we get back to common code, again, starting with int VEB, and again, it's all identical. Everything up until now has been really minor differences, storing things at different memory locations, things like that. Here's where the major differences come in with my code. On the right, you can see I had to do a complete rewrite of the one and ZRO routines. That's really it though, they're drop-in replacements and they do the exact same thing as one and ZRO in the 6530 code, but they use the 6522 timer instead of the 6530 timer. That's really the extent of the differences, and this code just builds and runs on a pet and works. I'll show you that in a moment. You can see at the end of my code that I just hard-coded the example Kim1 program here. This is really meant as a proof of concept, it's not like production code. Now you can watch it run. 